All right, hello everybody. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started with today's Space Club career chat. So welcome to week eight. We are so excited to have you all here. So welcome back to your Space Club Mission Control. We have Natasha here and then myself, Aspen. And today we have a special guest. We're so excited to have her here, um, Dr. Kelly Miller. She works at the Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio, Texas. She has a bachelor's in chemistry from Scripps College with a minor in East Asian studies and a, match, a master's and PhD in planetary science with a focus in geoscience from the University of Arizona. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Miller. We're so excited to have you. So before we get to all of y'all's questions, she's going to talk a little bit about her research and what she does. Since we got so many questions from you guys, we thought she we'd just have her jump it straight into it. So um, yeah, if you wanna go ahead and uh, just give them a brief overview, uh, overview of what you do. Great, yeah, thanks for having me. It's a lot of fun to be here today. Um, I just wanted to start with this, uh, this painting uh, that one of my fellow scientists, Dr. Keen, made for me, um, I guess a few years back. Uh, and it kind of summarizes some of the, some of the early research um, that I was doing. Uh, and this is um, a, an, an artist's interpretation of planet formation. Um, so this is maybe, maybe what our solar system looked like uh, back before Earth existed um, while, while the planets were being built. Um, next slide, please. So this is the research that was related to that painting that I was doing. Um, and so this is some research that I was doing on meteorites. Um, so meteorites are uh, space rocks that, that land on Earth and that we find. Um, and, um, and a lot of times they look, I don't know, can y'all see my mouse? Can they see my mouse? No, okay. Um, so that picture in the upper right with the hand in it um, kind of shows what, what a meteorite might look like. Um, so it's got this dark outside and then you can see the that that crust or that rind has kind of been stripped away a little bit um, I'm not sure if a, if a person did that or if um, it's scraped against a rock or something but that outside uh, happens as the rock is falling through the atmosphere um, and it, it burns off the outermost layer um, and forms this characteristic crust so if you cut one of those open um, and you stick it on an instrument like what you can see in the bottom left um, that's an electron microprobe uh, that I'm standing next to. And you can use an instrument like that. At the top, it uh, creates some electrons and it'll fire those at your sample. So if you put a slice, a very thin slice of one of these meteorites in there, you can get pictures kind of like the picture at the top left um, or the picture at the bottom right. And it shows you um, what the chemistry of these objects are. Um, so at the, at the bottom right, you can kind of see all the different textures in there. And there's some things that are labeled chondrules. Um, and then there's some things that are labeled CAIs. And so the CAIs there are the very oldest solids in our solar system. And those formed 4.568 billion years ago. Um, and then the chondrules uh, started off as free floating dust bunnies. Um, and there was some kind of a, a shock heating event um, that, that melted them. And for, for a little while they were floating balls of magma in space. Um, and then they cooled down and they formed these round objects. Um, so by studying these kinds of events, we can learn about uh, things like this shock heating event that happened uh, before planets even existed, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so another area of research that I've worked on um, is trying to understand where Titan's atmosphere came from. So Titan, uh, in the upper right photo, you can see a picture of, of Titan, which is a, a satellite or a moon um, of Saturn. And you can see there are Saturn's rings that are cutting across Titan there in that picture that was taken by the Cassini mission. Um, and then there's a, a strip um, in the middle of this slide that shows there was a, a lander probe um, that, that flew through uh, Titan's atmosphere and landed on the surface. And that's what it looked like on the surface. Um, and so you can see there are those rounded pebbles there. It kind of looks like the bottom of a, of a stream bed or something like that here on Earth. And the reason for that is that um, Titan is the only other body in our solar system that has liquid at the surface. And so here on Earth, liquid water is our, our main liquid. Um, and on Titan, it's ethane and methane. Um, so it's, uh, those are similar to the gases that you use to light your grill. 
but um, on Titan at those temperatures and pressures, um, it's a liquid. And so they've got uh, seas there. Um, and that's probably what gives those pebbles that shape. Um, so the, the atmosphere of Titan is one of the reasons that that liquid can be there. And so we want to know where that atmosphere came from. And so there's a cartoon schematic there um, that kind of shows an idea that we've been testing out. And the idea is that you might go from something like the cometary body shown on the left. Um, if, you, if you take the chemistry of the comets and you um, build a, a Titan-sized planet out of it, uh, you get a lot of organic material in the center, kind of like coal. Um, and, and then when you heat that up, you might produce some gases. And if those gases escape, uh, then you could create part of the atmosphere, um, something like 50% that way, maybe. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, so then uh, the, the third major area that I was gonna talk about today um, is looking at Saturn's rings. So I mentioned on the last slide this uh, Cassini mission, um, and there's a picture of Cassini on, on the bottom panel here. Um, so Cassini was active at Saturn from 2004 until 2017. And then in 2017, it was running out of fuel um, and they weren't gonna be able to control it uh, very well anymore. And they were worried that it might crash into somewhere like Titan or another one of Saturn's moons called Enceladus, um, where there is potential that maybe there could be life. So we didn't want to accidentally crash into a body that could maybe have life. And instead, the decision was to um, dispose of the spacecraft in Saturn's atmosphere, plunge it into the atmosphere, and that's, that's how it would end. Um, so the top right panel there uh, kind of shows the final orbits um, to do that. So before it plunged into Saturn's atmosphere, it flew between Saturn's atmosphere and its rings uh, several times. And we were able to um, collect data with the instruments as we were doing that. And so one of the really surprising things that we found when we did that um, was that the rings are falling into Saturn's atmosphere, and the innermost ring is. Um, and the, the main way that we know that is by using an instrument called a mass spectrometer. And I'll show you a picture of that on the next slide, um, a similar instrument, but, but you can think of a mass spectrometer as like a nose. So it sniffs the environment. Yeah, so on the right there is a picture of a mass spectrometer, a different mass spectrometer. Um, that one's going to Europa. Um, so a mass spectrometer is kind of like a, a nose and it can sniff the environment and then based on what it smells, it can, it can identify what's there. Kind of like, I don't know, if you're upstairs and you sniff something and cooking in the kitchen, you can probably tell if it's um, spaghetti or chicken um, just from how it smells, right? Um, so when we sniffed, we were expecting to smell a lot of Saturn atmosphere, but instead we smelled um, a lot of water and organic material, uh, which we found out was coming from the rings. Um, so that was unexpected and, and pretty cool. Um, so this is, I guess, kind of the, the last main slide. Um, so this is forecasting into the future. Oh, can you go back one? Yeah, okay. So, um, so those missions have, have ended and we've still got some, some research ongoing in those areas, but um, we're also ramping up for a new mission and it's called the Europa Clipper mission. Um, <clears throat> so it's going to go to Europa, which is a satellite of Jupiter. And you can see on the, the picture on the left there, Jupiter in the background. Um, and so kind of like Titan, one of the things that's exciting about Europa is that it's got this um, liquid water ocean underneath the icy shell. And so we wanna go uh, learn, learn more about that and learn if it's possible that there could be life at Europa. Um, so for, for this mission now, one of the things that I'm working on is I'm helping to calibrate um, a mass spectrometer like the one that's shown here on the right. So this is a, a test version of the instrument that's going to go to Europa. Um, and so when I say calibrate, we're basically trying to figure out how do we know what we know from this instrument. If it tells us um, that there is oxygen present uh, and there's a certain amount of oxygen, how do we know that? And what, um, what math do we have to do to make sure that we know that that's real? Um, yeah, next slide. Mm. 
And this is just kind of a, a summary overview of the, the different projects. Um, so, um, yeah, we can skip ahead to the questions. Awesome. All right. Thanks for that awesome overview. You went so in depth. Love it. Okay. So we got a couple questions about college and what that's like. So the first question is, what were the deciding factors when you chose to apply for Scripps College? And this is from K-A-L-L-E in New York. Yeah. Um, great question. So I, um, when I was going to college, I, I knew that I wanted to do something in science. Um, and I thought that I wanted to be a marine biologist. And so I was going to major in biology. Um, and then I ended up switching over to chemistry. And so um, I, I knew there might be some change there. So one thing I was looking for was um, some flexibility in, in majors and making sure that I'd have a little bit of time to explore the pathways and making sure that um, the program I was going into wasn't super specialized um, because for undergrad, I wanted to um, have something that was a little bit more, more broad so that I could kind of explore my options a little bit more. Um, that was one of the, one of the really good things. Um, one of the deciding factors was scholarship money. Um, I, I got a good scholarship there and so I went there. Um, another deciding factor was that it felt like home when I went. Um, so I was very fortunate for that. Um, and, and I liked that it uh, had, had small classes. Um, so I had a lot of interaction with my professors um, and I was able to um, get to know my fellow students a lot better. Um, those were the things that I was kind of looking for. And then now that I'm looking back, um, one of the other really great things about it is that it's a liberal arts program. Um, and so you'll probably hear me say a couple times how important communication is in, uh, in science and in being a scientist. And so the, the liberal arts education, I think, really gave me a very strong foundation for, uh, for written and spoken communication. And that's really served me well um, as, as a scientist. Yeah, I always hear that whenever you're looking for a college, you try and find a home away from home. And so that's awesome that you found that there. Yeah, yeah, that, that was also, I was also interested in that and, and fortunate to be able to pursue that. So. All right, the next question is what interests you most about planetary science? And this is from Pigs in Space in Texas. Yeah, um, so one of the things that I really like working in planetary science is that it's always something different. Um, it's really interdisciplinary. So I get to learn a little bit about um, physics and a little bit of chemistry and a little bit of astronomy and some biology and all of it kind of comes together. Um, and my job is to try and pick out parts of that and synthesize it to tell a story, um, which I really enjoy doing. And it means that if I start to get bored with one thing, um, I can just shift focus a little bit and, and try something else different. Um, so I'm always learning and I'm, and I'm always finding new things to get excited about. Um, yeah, that's, that's one of the things I really like about doing planetary science. I guess the reason, the, the first time I realized that it was just really cool to me um, was, was actually hearing about, um, uh, discovery of, of water on Mars and they, they had found a certain mineral there and from that certain mineral they were able to say that there had been water in the past which I thought was just the coolest thing to you know to find one material and then be able to solve the puzzle and go back and figure out what it used to be like millions of years ago. Yeah, yeah I feel like there's always something new happening with like space science and it, whether in the news or in research like there's always like it's so relevant and there's so much research going on it's exciting. Yeah, yeah, it is. All right, so I have a next set of questions so these are kind of like a combo question from two different teams. Um, so I'm going to ask them together and then you can kind of answer them as you want. So first question is how does chemistry help space exploration from space rangers in New York and then. I thought this was a perfect question to go with it was how does studying the chemistry of the solar system affect us so how does chemistry affect space exploration in general and then how does it like affect us as individuals. Yeah, um, so I think there are probably a couple couple different ways um, that these questions could be answered, but for me, 
Um, for me and my focus, chemistry is really about finding out where we're from, right? So, um, so in terms of space exploration, if I want to learn about how the planets formed, um, what what were the building blocks for the planets? What what went into them, and then what steps happened after that to create what we see today? Um, chemistry is the the path that I take to to learn those things, um, and the reason that that um, affects me and us in society is because it's really about learning how we got here and. Um, you know, if, if we're if we're alone in the universe or not, and um, what what processes create life, um, and what processes create uh, the beautiful world around us. So um, that's that's my answer for these questions. Yeah. Do you believe in aliens? We got a lot of questions about that. <laughs> um, I think my personal opinion is that it seems very likely that there is some kind of life somewhere else. Um, yeah, and we'll see, we'll see if there's, I, I don't know if that means that there's intelligent life somewhere else. It might be, you know, some bacteria living under a rock somewhere. Um, but I think that probably exists at least. Yeah. All right, the next question is, what was it like teaching English in South Korea? And did you ever think you would become what you are today? From yeah. so, in Harlandale, Texas. So um, I'm I'm glad that you asked this question uh, because one of the things that I heard a lot um, when I was in high school and an undergrad um, that that almost dissuaded me from science was that you couldn't major in science and still do things like study abroad or teach English in Korea um, and that you needed to have a very linear career path if you were going to succeed. And, um, and those were things that were important to me. I wanted to learn more about the world. I wanted to interact with different cultures. Um, and uh, so I decided to prove them wrong and, and they're wrong. So you can do those things and still have a career in science. Um, teaching English in South Korea was, was really great. Um, I learned a lot about communication, uh, which is very important for science. I learned a lot about myself. Um, I developed more independence. I met some really great people. Um, I learned to cook some good food. Um, yeah, and and I knew when I when I went to do that, um, I spent the first year that I was there writing my applications for graduate school, and then um, and then the second year was kind of a holding pattern. Um, so I knew when I was there that it was um, kind of just a pause in my science career. And I chose to do it at that point between undergrad and grad school because that really is the easiest time to do a pause like that and still continue on a science trajectory. Um, yeah. Perfect. All right. And then the next question is, this is a long one. Is there anything that you wish someone had told you uh, told you when you were younger that you can tell us? Do you ever have that, I wish someone had told me this sooner, or I wish I knew this when I was younger moment from Galaxy Invaders in Texas? Yeah, so I think for me, um, I'm going to hammer on, on it again, um, but it really goes back to communication. And for me personally, um, uh, that, was, that was about the importance of visual communication. So I had all those images that I shared in those first slides um, and those really help explain the story of the research a lot. And so um, when I was younger, I didn't understand the value of art and visual communication very well. Um, and I didn't invest a lot of time or energy into getting better at those things. Um, and so now I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to learn, um, you know, how to create figures for my papers and how to, um, create clear diagrams and things like that. Um, but, you know, I, I also showed at the very beginning that beautiful painting from, from Dr. Keen. Um, and um, there, there are all kinds of ways to bring visual communication into science. Um, and that's something that I'm learning more and more and something that I wish I had known earlier that you don't have to choose one or the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like when people think of science, they only think of like pie charts and graphs yeah. and equations. You don't think about like the visual aspect behind it. Yeah, yeah. It's so important though. Yeah. 
All right, so next we have something we've never done before. If everybody, everybody watching, we have some rapid fire questions for Dr. Miller here. So we had, again, y'all submitted so many great questions and we wanted to make sure we got to as many as possible. So we're challenging Dr. Miller to answer. We have about five questions and you have like one minute to answer them. So they're really quick off the top of your head. Are you ready, Dr. Miller? I'm ready. All right. Okay, the first question from Lunar Ladies. What is the craziest thing you've ever come across during your research? Um, the links that you have to go to to protect samples sometimes. Um, I spent about a month during graduate school covering everything in aluminum foil in the entire lab, pencils and tables and implements in aluminum foil um, to try and keep things clean. Awesome. All right, next question. Um, from Catchy Constellations, what kind of dogs do you have and what are their names? Yeah, they're all three mixed breeds. I've got a boxer mix named Mara. I've got a, um, a Chawini named Fenris. And then I don't know what the third one is. Like some kind of poodle Chihuahua mix maybe named Athena. Aww. All right. Um, from Florida Men, what is your favorite song on the guitar? Uh, I, I like Romanza a lot. I'm, I'm learning classical guitar. Um, so I haven't learned any rock hits. Um, yeah. Cool. All right. Have you ever found a planet that could support alien life or even human life from Galaxy Girls? So, so I didn't find it. Um, but, but the Cassini mission that I was talking about um, found that Enceladus, uh, which is a really cool little moon, go look it up, it's about the size of the United Kingdom, um, has liquid water, it has an energy source, um, and it has um, the, the chemical building blocks of life. We know all three of those things are present together. Um, and so that's kind of our definition for if somewhere could support life. Um, that doesn't mean that it does support life. Uh, just, just that we think the ingredients are there. Yeah. All right, last questions of rapid fire. Um, if someone wanted to do your job, what advice would you tell them from Alien Invasion? Um, I would say stay curious and, and yeah, pursue, pursue all the different things that make you curious. Um, and, you know, sometimes it'll be a, a deep rabbit hole that you go down and sometimes you'll branch off in different directions. But as you go along, um, you'll learn something from each of those excursions that's gonna be useful in the future, even if it's not immediately useful. Awesome. Yay, Natasha, do we have any last minute questions? Yes, uh, follow up on the planet that supports alien life from you mentioned the Cassini mission. What was the name of that planet? Yeah, so it's, it's a satellite, it's a moon, um, and its name is Enceladus, E-N-C-E-L-A-D-U-S. And it's a, a moon that's in orbit around Saturn. Awesome. And then a second question, if you ever made contact with aliens, what would you tell them? Hmm. Ooh, that's hard. What would I tell them? Um... I have no idea what I would say either. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel like, I feel like I'd be more interested in asking them a lot of things and less in telling them about us. I guess I, I would want to know, um, I think I would want to know about their, their culture um, and, and how, they view, how they view the universe. Um, it's always pretty hard to figure out the answer to those questions too though. Well, those were our questions. So thank you so much, Dr. Miller, uh, for joining us. Um, I know the students had a great time looking at your website. Um, so I encourage them you know, to look more. I don't know if you update that um, to see the research that you're working on. Um, but we thank you for being part of our Space Club career chat. Yeah, thanks a bunch. This was fun. Great questions. All right, so then let's move on to our project highlights. 
So this time we decided not to make a video because you guys were sketching your lunar base. And this was before Thanksgiving. If you can even remember what mission seven was, we were sketching the lunar base. So Aspen, you can go to the next slide. These are a few of the sketches that we picked. There were, y'all did an amazing job. I just picked a couple of them here. Um, and we were just impressed with the wide range of designs, the really unique features that you guys had. And right now I know you're working on building these designs. And I've already seen a couple go on um, the Goose Chase app. I'm really excited to see what else you come up with. So awesome work. Um, keep going. This is our last mission. I can't believe it. Um, but now let's go to the part you're waiting for, our raffle winners. So this week we have one winner and they will receive our Little Bit Space Rover Inventor Kit. We thought this was perfect because you're doing uh, the lunar base. Several of you put rovers in your base and this is a rover you can build. It has sensors, it can move around and you control it with your phone. Um, this is brought to you by Sphero. Um, little bits and Sphero merged. If you've used the Sphero robot, this is a really cool kit. Um, so they have several of these inventor kits. So this team will win the rover one. Let's find out who our winners are. So mission seven raffle winner goes to Space Cows in Monte Rio, California. Great job, guys. Okay, and now next week is our very last Space Club career chat for Mission to the Moon. And it's a big one. We have a real live NASA astronaut. He's also an aerospace engineer. He's currently a professor, but before that he was an astronaut with NASA, been to space twice. His longest mission was in 2008, six months on the International Space Station. So this is Dr. Chamatoff. We're very excited. I have posted in Goose Chase for question submissions. So think about what would you want to ask someone who has actually been to space? I look forward to having him. So we'll see you there next week, same time, same place, Wednesday, December 9th. But also at that final career chat, we're gonna reveal our grand prize winners. Any team that reaches 25,000 points will be entered in this raffle. Now, 70 teams, last I checked, have already hit this. So I encourage every single team, keep submitting. You can do it. 25,000 points. You've got this. If you can get them in by Tuesday, December 8th. So we're giving you some extra time to finish up those missions. And I'm really excited about seeing your final uh, lunar base designs. So that's it from Space Club this week. Uh, we hope you guys have an awesome rest of your week, and we will see you next Wednesday. See everybody. Bye.